Hi, how are you? I hope you're having a great day. We got hit by below freezing temperatures. Not something we get often in Indiana, but occasionally in the winter. And I'm sure many of you have too. I was feeling well until I wasn't. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you like the information on this channel, I hope you will consider being a part of our family. I've tried to organize this material in such a way that you can hear my train of thought. In my last video on dementia, I talked about how researchers in an unusual small study developed a protocol for eliminating Alzheimer's. They believed the protocol created an environment in the brain where new synaptic growth in Alzheimer's patients occurred. These patients prior to the study had mild symptoms, but mild in comparison to severe dementia. These patients were still having severe cognitive symptoms like problems recognizing faces, adding numbers together, getting lost close to home, and other devastating things. Some lost their jobs, one could no longer play the guitar, and one could no longer speak multiple languages. So when they reversed these symptoms and maintained that reversal for over four years, I was definitely intrigued. So today, I'd like to talk about diabetes of the brain and how it might correlate with fibromyalgia and ME-CFS. Here we go. When you think about the cognitive issues facing fibromyalgia and ME-CFS, although nowhere near as traumatizing, it's easy to make comparisons. All three diseases are thought to have a neuroinflammatory component. I mean, our community, the fibro and MECFS community, may have trouble multitasking, have difficulty finding the right words or <laughs> saying the wrong words, as I often do. Information processing is slower. We forget dates and appointments. We lose things and can't find our car in a parking lot to save ourselves. And you can probably think of a few other things as well. During my earlier days of studying fibromyalgia, a multidisciplinary approach to medicine was said to be the most beneficial to our community. Like multiple doctors who treat the various aspects of our disease. We may see a pain doctor, a gastro doctor, a family doctor, a sleep doctor, a physio specialist. Well, you get the point. The nature of most chronic diseases is complex, so treating several symptoms at once makes sense. As long as each doctor coordinates treatment with the other doctor. So until we know for sure what fibromyalgia and ME-CFS is, a multivaried approach is probably the best way to treat it. So that study on Alzheimer's suggested that many of the clinical trials that fail may not be because the treatment doesn't work but because it wasn't tested with other treatments. And on the other note, none of the participants in that study used all of the recommended treatments, but they did enough of them to reach a threshold. So that leads me to the topic for today. So 
Some researchers believe that Alzheimer's is a metabolic disease and call it diabetes three or diabetes of the brain. This may also correlate with fibromyalgia and ME-CFS. Brain does shrink to some degree in healthy aging, but we don't lose neurons in large numbers. In Alzheimer's, damage is widespread. Neurons stop working, lose connections, and eventually die. At first, the connections that involve memory are affected. Then other areas responsible for language, reasoning, and social behavior are damaged. The disease becomes fatal. It's believed that chronic inflammation by the buildup of glial cells normally clears away debris, including beta amyloid plaques. And currently, the focus is on a gene, TREM2, that tells the microglia to do their job, clear away the junk in the brain. If Alzheimer's is a metabolic disease, meaning the processes that the body uses, to create energy from the food we eat, we can see how the molecules that are made into energy and transported to our cells throughout the body are disrupted. Metabolism helps the body grow and repair tissues. Food is broken down in our bodies into molecules called glucose. Glucose is used to produce energy. And this is called catabolism. Metabolic abnormalities start outside the brain, but affect the whole body. Healthcare professionals often miss the signs that damage to the brain in Alzheimer's is occurring until cognitive decline interferes with daily life. It's believed that Alzheimer's is primarily a failure of the brain to properly use glucose as a fuel. But they're not saying that type 2 diabetes causes Alzheimer's. Many diabetics will never get Alzheimer's. And many Alzheimer's patients will never get diabetes. So what they are saying is that the result from the same underlying metabolic imbalances potentially occurring. In Alzheimer's, damage is mostly in the brain, and in type 2 diabetes, damage occurs primarily in the muscles, organs, and peripheral tissues, or those parts outside of the brain. Alzheimer's is often looked at as a metabolic disturbance, namely insulin resistance, and hyperinsulinemia. That means elevated levels in the bloodstream of insulin over a longer period of time. There is growing interest in the central nervous system insulin signaling and the impact of both central and peripheral systems. The expression pattern of the insulin receptor in humans is evenly distributed between the cell types. Insulin must first cross barrier cells in the brain for activation of insulin receptors in the central nervous system, which are located on neurons, astrocytes, and parasites. Here's a diagram of the role of insulin receptors. type 2 diabetes, the body is not effectively using carbs to sustain energy levels. The same scenario is thought to be happening in Alzheimer's. Fatigue, chronic pain, and poor energy levels are experienced, hmm. just like in fibromyalgia and ME-CFS. There is a widespread starvation and death of brain cells secondary to insulin resistance. Hyperinsulinemia. 
and the lost ability to metabolize glucose. In Alzheimer's, mild cognitive impairments precedes it. The brain is struggling to fuel itself. People with fibromyalgia and ME-CFS are on a path of discovery while we search for answers to our energy and pain problems. Many of us have early symptoms of type 2 diabetes, like dry eyes and mouth and frequent urination, and then add the physical and mental fatigue and exercise problems. Is the brain starving our peripheral organs and muscles of glucose? That's what some researchers believe. Type 2 diabetes also shares the same autonomic nervous system dysfunctions present in fibromyalgia and ME-CFS like low heart rate variability and slowed heart rate recovery after exercise. Then add small fiber neuropathy to the mix. 40% of fibromyalgia patients experience this, which is also common in diabetes. Leptin resistance is common in ME-CFS. And then add the cognitive problems found in diabetes that are also common in fibro. And in one recent study, insulin resistance was found in 79% of fibromyalgia patients. And in another recent study, insulin resistance and reported falls, people falling down due to higher muscle activation failure and pain intensity were found, but there's more. Women with fibromyalgia were 5.56 times more likely than healthy controls to have metabolic syndrome, also called met -Psy. In another recent study, patients with fibromyalgia were nearly four times at a higher risk of met -Psy. And in another recent study, 48% of fibromyalgia patients had markers of met -Psy and had significantly higher pain. Also, if you have IBS with fibromyalgia, almost 37% of patients had met -Psy, compared to almost 22% in the control. And lastly, in another recent study, researchers administered glucose to fibromyalgia patients and healthy controls. They found impaired glucose regulation in fibromyalgia patients. The authors stated that lifestyle factors are important in glucose regulation for prevention or early treatment of diabetes and associated complications. With all of these recent studies, there must be something alarming about our glucose tolerance. Over the last 60 years of research, advice on what foods to eat have shown to be incorrect and research was found to be skewed. A diet low in fat and cholesterol and an emphasis on carbohydrates, specifically grains and fats found in vegetable oils like soybean and corn oils were misguided. We were cautioned away from more stable saturated fats from animal foods and tropical plants like coconut and palm oils. Slowly, our current dietary recommendations are changing. Our diet is generally lower in antioxidant-rich dark green vegetables and brightly colored vegetables and fruits, which our ancestors consumed. Starchy carbs like wheat, potatoes, and corn are often consumed. We have a deficient diet that has led to obesity, heart disease, poor eyesight, acne, and polycystic ovarian syndrome, and cancer. When a person consumes starchy or sugary foods, 
and their body reacts with high levels of blood glucose or insulin or both, then the body is improperly handling carbohydrates. A multitude of markers are used to establish MET-PSI or metabolic syndrome. So what does this all mean for our fibro and ME-CFS communities? Inflammation and metabolic problems may be present. Many of the recommendations make sense to me. Paleo diet is often recommended. That means we need to get back to our roots. And I'm not an expert on diet by any means. So I'll be investigating this further. But eating a diet high in fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, eggs, lean meats, especially grass-fed or wild game, fish, especially those rich in omega-3 fatty acids like salmon, mackerel, albacore tuna, and oils from fruits and nuts sounds pretty good to me. I eat like this? Not currently. I eat a lot of the good healthy foods that I should eat, but I also eat some of these foods that I shouldn't eat. I think it would be an easy diet to stick to, except for the butter. I do love butter. I haven't tried ghee. It's the next best thing to butter, they say. Uh, have you tried ghee? I mean, it doesn't have lactose in it, so if you're lactose intolerant, want to find something that doesn't have the cholesterol in it, this would be a good alternative. And cheese. I don't eat a lot of cheese, but I do like it. And starchy vegetables. That means no squash, peas, corn, potatoes, or yams. I mean, they do provide great sources of vitamin C, B, and potassium. And there are studies that show their benefits if you eat them in moderation, especially if you're a diabetic because starchy vegetables can raise your blood sugar. So perhaps we need to do the same thing. But I do love the following vegetables. These are non-starchy vegetables. So I hope all of this makes sense to you. Do you see the connection? If you have any questions or experience on the paleo diet, please put that in the comment section below. We're on this journey together and I think we can figure it out together. But it's also possible that what works for me might not work for you and vice versa. I send you gentle hugs and support. Love you. These patients were still having severe and no, although near, although nowhere near trauma. My goodness. Uh, the be oh, it's believed that the buildup many diabetes. Elevated levels in the blood spread, hyperinsulin, hyperinsulinemia, hyperinsulin, boy, that's not a fun word, hyperinsulin, nin,
God. Have 